Actually, this does feel really high, but it is nice to see you. <laughs> Excuse me, my voice is a bit croaky. I'm hoping it will last, but it may be a blessing if it doesn't. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, we're looking this week at Freedom in Christ Session 8, which is about handling our emotions well. It's actually quite a big subject, isn't it? And one that I really don't want to give any wrong information about. So right from the start, I want to say a couple of things that are true. Our emotions were given to us and created by God. We were created in his image, and like God has emotions, so do we. So they are a God-given gift. But also, we can sometimes get the wrong impression about our emotions, can't we? And that, you know, there may be elements of them that aren't acceptable or right. And hopefully we'll explore a little bit about that um, as we speak this morning. But the, the thing with everything that God has given us and created us to be, there is a godly way in which to express our emotions. And things aren't a problem. I'm very much a pragmatist, but I see this reflected in scripture as well. Things aren't a problem until they're a problem. <laughs> and sometimes we think there are issues, don't we? <laughs> and in our day-to-day -day lives, I wonder how we woke up this morning. People sometimes say, oh, I woke up in a bad mood this morning. Um, and you can't really have control over that, can you? And we're influenced by people around us. If you've been in a group of people and they're in a foul mood, yeah. generally it affects your mood to some extent. If you're with people that are joyful and happy, to some extent, <laughs> my hearing's gone as well. It's it's okay. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. The hopefully chair's moved. <laughs> so many ways I can handle it. <laughs> but if we're around people who are joyful and happy, it has an influence on us, doesn't it? And uh, in, in my workplace, you know, there are people who I work with who when they're on shift, there's a joy that comes to the ward because that's their personality and their nature. And if the people we're around or we're working with, and, and Becky and I were talking about this, are a little bit stressful, sometimes it can make us feel that as well. So there is that dynamic. Have any of you had a difficult situation that people have known about and they told you what you should feel? I can remember that, and people say to me, oh, that must make you feel dreadful. Oh, you must be so this, or you must be so that. And I think the thing with our emotions is to be aware of ourselves, isn't it? And to stand in what is true. And truth is one of the key things that I'd like us to think about today, about what is true. So how do our emotions work? Now, there used to be a game called Simon Says, didn't there? <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to make you do it. But if I were to say to you, touch your nose, you could choose to touch your nose or not. I'm not going to touch my toes because it's been a long time since I've been able to do that. But if I were to say, touch your toes, I could choose whether or not I could do that. Just for a second, Think about whether you can stop your heart beating. The technical nurse is amongst us. No, there may be ways, but they're just in, just in general terms. You can't stop your heart beating, can you? It's the only muscle in the body that is involuntary, and it will just, it will beat. The same with our breathing. They are things that we don't have specific control over. And that can be true also of our emotions. We can't directly control how we feel. And our feelings also reveal what we really believe. We may not be able to will ourselves to change how we feel, but we can change our emotions over time by choosing to change what we can control by how we believe and how we behave. And I quite like this phrase when I read it in Freedom in Christ, because our emotions aren't there for a purpose. And they are to our soul what our ability to feel pain is to our body. <coughs> Fortunately, one of the 
diseases that we don't see so much of now, although it is still prevalent in the world, is leprosy. And one of the biggest challenges in leprosy is that, that people cannot feel. So if they burn themselves or cut themselves, there's not that awareness. So our pain often is a reflection of something that we need to do something about. And it is a good warning signal and a good indicator to us of our emotional health. Our feelings can let us know when something isn't right. And if what we believe doesn't reflect truth, then what we feel won't reflect that reality. Now all of our life experiences will be very different and our emotional well-being will be different. And we're not just talking about negative emotions. I'm sure this morning already we've experienced some positive emotions and some of us may have experienced more of the negative. You know, I can't help but wake up and see the sun shining and feel happy about that. <laughs> and when I come into church and I see my church family, do you know what? That makes me joyful as well. But when my husband's alarm clock goes off at six o'clock on a Sunday morning, I didn't feel so good about that one. <laughs> very fortunate that I am a person that is slow to anger. <laughs> the heckling chair has really moved today. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so I say it again, if what we believe doesn't reflect truth, then what we feel won't reflect reality. So life's events don't have to determine who you are or what you feel, but often it's our perception of those events, isn't it? Yes. And the more we commit ourselves to the truth and choose to believe what God says is true, the more we can see our circumstances from God's perspective, and the less our feelings run away with us. This is a bit of a lengthy scripture, but I am going to read it all for good reason. So, Lamentations, chapter 3, gives us an example of this. So here is Jeremiah. I am a man who has suffered greatly. The Lord has used the Babylonians to punish our people. He's driven me away. He has made me walk in darkness instead of light. He's turned his powerful hand against me. He's done it again and again, all day long. He has worn my body out, he has broken my bones, he has surrounded me and attacked me, he has made me suffer bitterly. He's not having a good day, is he? <laughs> he has made things hard for me. He has made me live in darkness, like those who are dead and gone. He has built walls around me, I can't escape. It's not getting any better, is it? He has put heavy chains on me. I call out and I cry for help, but he won't listen to me when I pray. He has put up a stone wall to block my way. He has made my paths crooked. I'm afraid there's more. He has been like a bear waiting to attack me. He has been like a lion hiding in the bushes. He has dragged me off the path. He has torn me to pieces and he has left me helpless. And he has got his bow ready to use. He has shot his arrows at me. I'm thinking at this point, if there's a bear and a lion, I don't need much more than that really, but you know, Jeremiah wants to get his point across. The arrows from his quiver have gone through my heart. My people laugh at me all the time. They sing and make fun of me all day long. The Lord has made my life bitter. He has made me suffer bitterly. And it's all. <laughs> he made me chew stones that broke my teeth. He has walked all over me in the dust. I have lost all hope of ever having any peace. I've forgotten what good times are like. So I say, my glory has faded away. My hope in the Lord has gone. I remember how I suffered and wandered. I remember how bitter my life was. I remember it very well. My spirit is very sad deep down inside me. And thank goodness for this. But here is something else I remember. 
And it gives me hope because the Lord loves us very much. We haven't been completely destroyed. His loving concern never fails. His great love is new every morning. Lord, how faithful you are. I say to myself, the Lord is everything I will ever need. So I will put my hope in him. That's amazing, isn't it? <coughs> but here is something else I remember, and it gives me hope. Because the Lord loves us very much. That's an amazing example from scripture, isn't it? Up until about first 18, it was woe is me. And I don't want to trivialise life experiences. I've faced some challenges in life. I remember at one particular time, I used to have a chant I used to say to myself, and it was this. This will hurt. This will hurt a lot. But it won't kill me. <laughs> and I wanted to, to be real with how I was feeling, but also have a, an aim that it wasn't going to defeat me. And so we can be real with our emotions as Jeremiah was. And his circumstances hadn't changed. But what changed Jeremiah was he changed his mind about how he looked at his circumstances. And this can change how we feel. Another wonderful example in scripture is one from David and David and Goliath. And I'm not going to read the scripture, but if you're able to put that up, Martin, that would be lovely. And if you want to just take a look at it and have a read of it. And we probably know the story of David and Goliath, where David, one of the youngest in the tribe, the youngest in the family, went against a giant. And as he walked towards battle, was he prepared for that battle? No. What he had with him was what he had. He had his sling and his stones. I wonder what the giant saw when he saw David walking towards him. He probably saw someone that he thought would be a, a, a walkover. He probably almost felt embarrassed going up against him. He, he knew he would defeat him. So what the, what the giant probably did was look at David in relationship to himself. And that's probably what the Israelites did as well. But what David saw was the giant in relationship to God and who he was in God. In our own lives we can do this. And uh, many of you will know that uh, <coughs> our daughter Lydia is travelling at the moment. She will be travelling until she's a very old woman. I've come to terms with that. And, uh, and she loves going to exotic places and, and going off the beaten track and really getting into the cultures. And she, has been to Nepal and a couple of days ago she crossed into India which is a glorious country and a great place for her to explore. But if I'm truthful, when I heard that Lydia was travelling and particularly as she was travelling on her own, what do you reckon my emotions were? Mm -hmm. I was afraid. <laughs> I was sorely afraid. And I looked at it as a place to be fearful of, not the country in specific but the fact that she was on her own and she gave me some very wise words. She said, Mum, investigate this. Go on the internet. Look in your up. Look at the stories of other lone women who have travelled there. She said, I have investigated this. I am prepared. And I want to do this. And I want to go with your blessing, but I'm going to go. Either way. And so she flew off, and it's taken me a bit of time. But she sends me glorious pictures, and she's in a place of Valeresi at the moment. It looks stunning. You know, she talks to me about the glorious food she's eating that costs her eight pence, and all the people she's meeting. And I just see her grow in stature as I look at the photos. And so I've been able to talk to her and say, Lydia, go explore. Explore, live life to the full, and when you come back, we'll have a great party, and I'm going to really enjoy listening 
to the joy that you're experiencing in life. Does that mean there aren't challenges out there? No, there are challenges. They're real and they hurt. But God is our rock and our, our strength in all of our circumstances. So we believe the truth and we live truth by faith. When we're able to do that and behave like that, then we'll experience a change in our feelings, which means that those feelings will still be there, but they won't control us and they won't damage us. So we learn how to handle our emotions well. There's an example um, of a warning light. I'm, I'm guessing most of us either drive cars or are driven around. And often there are warning lights coming up, aren't there? Well, maybe that's just the cars I drive. <laughs> <laughs> or my driving. Um, and there are things we can do. We can ignore the warning light, can't we? Doesn't always work. I've broken down a few times doing that. That's called suppression. We can smash the warning light. <laughs> which could be termed as indiscriminate expression. And we can look under the bonnet, which is about acknowledgement. And this is the way that God would want us to do. He wants us to look under the bonnet and to acknowledge our emotions and our feelings, but also look to his example for guidance as to how to look after emotions. Jesus was born fully man, yet being fully God. He had the whole range of emotions that, deep, that we do. And when we look at the journey he had, he went through most of the sorrows and pains that we will. He experienced joy, you know, anger, frustration. He experienced loss. He experienced betrayal. And he experienced death at the hands of others. Yet he shows us in his life and in his example how to handle our emotions as well. He wept over Jerusalem. He was a man of compassion. He did get angry. You know, the, the turning of the, the tables in the temple. He, he was accused of being a friend of sinners, which he took as a compliment because he used to go to parties and have a good time. He knew how to be joyful. He knew how to live in the full range of his emotions. When he was on the cross, he asked if it could be taken from him. But then he said, yet yeah, not your will, not my will, sorry, but yours be done. Jesus humbled himself with his loving <coughs> Heavenly Father. So as children of God, we're not primarily products of our past. We're products of Christ's work on the cross and his resurrection. We can't change our past, but we can be free from it. I know I've used this story before, but I'll use it again because it is pertinent. I found out at 14 I was adopted. I came from a very loving family. I adore my parents. And it rocked my world for a bit of time. It really did. And uh, I had no idea how to handle that bit of information. Because I had such a secure upbringing. So I thought, I know what I'll do, I'll run away. So I ran ever such a long way away. I ran to my best friend's house, whose parents knew my parents, <laughs> who then promptly took me back home. <laughs> that was the element of my rebellion. Um, but I was delivered back safely into the hands of people that know and love me. And over the years, I've done a little dance with this. But every time I do that little dance, I go before God. And this is what God says to me. Now you have to remember, God knows me very well. He knows each of you very well. I doubt he would talk to you the way he talks to me. But when I go to God with this little dance I do, he says to me, so what? So what? And he reminds me of his fatherhood. He reminds me of the positives that my adoption put me into a warm, loving family who adored me. And my father drove me once to a power station in Shoreham and parked the car 
and said I would climb that and get the top brick for you. So God said to me, so what? <laughs> and that's the deal. We don't have to be defined by our past or our challenging experiences or what other people may tell us how we should feel. We can be defined by the love of our Heavenly Father who loved us so much that he went to the cross for us and to the grave and was risen again. We shall know the truth and the truth will set us free. Mm -hmm.